so um, my um, charge was to give some survey about classical parallel repetition and then move to uh, describe a recent result about parallel repetition of entangled uh, that we had with David Schreier and Thomas Vidic. <coughs> so we've seen this many times this week, um, but I can't afford not to describe it again. So this is my um, animation for a two-player, one-round game. Uh, it's given by a bipartite graph. A that's U and V, and question pair is just an edge between a vertex U and a vertex V, and this edge has a constraint on it, uh, denoted pi UV. And the semantics of the game uh, are as usual, so there's <coughs> two players, Alice and Bob, um, and a verifier. The verifier selects an edge UV at random, sends U to Alice and V to Bob, and then Alice needs to respond with some answer alpha, Bob responds with the beta, and based on the constraint uh, pi v, uh, the verifier decides if they uh, win the game. So if alpha beta, the pair alpha beta is in the constraint, they win. Uh, so classically, uh, Alice and Bob are required not to communicate with each other, meaning they can communicate all they want before the game begins, but after Alice received U and Bob received V, they're not allowed to talk to each other. And this means that Alice's strategy uh, is really just a function of her question U. She can be randomized, but it turns out that that won't help her. So she might as well be deterministic and just be a function from the questions U to the alphabet, the answer set sigma. And similarly for Bob, it's just a function from the questions V to the answer set sigma. <coughs> Uh, and the value of the game is just the maximum of all possible strategies, F for Bob and G for Alice here, of the fraction of question pairs UV or edges UV for which their answers satisfy the constraint. So that's the classical value of the game. So example we've already seen, but I want to go through it uh, now, is the three-set game. So let's start with a three-set instance. So it's you have a bunch of uh, Boolean variables, <coughs> x1 to xn, and a collection of clauses. Each clause is an OR of three literals, x1 or not x2 or x7, for example. So this is a three-set formula. And from this, we can construct a game by just uh, looking at the clauses as possible questions for Bob and the variables as possible questions for Alice. We can call it the clause versus variable game. Uh, the game goes as follows. The <coughs> verifier chooses a random clause, sends it to Bob, and a random variable among the three variables of the clause and sends that to Alice. Okay, so for example, here Bob got this clause, x, not xi or xi prime or <coughs> xi double prime. And one of these three variables is xi, so Alice gets xi. And then what are they supposed to answer? Bob is supposed to give some assignment to this clause that satisfies it. So 0, 1, 0 is a good answer. And Alice gives an assignment to xi. And they win if the assignment is consistent, if the value that Bob gave, gave to xi is consistent with the value that Alice gave. And uh, that's, that's a description of the game. Now it's very easy to see that if uh, the three set had a satisfying assignment, then the players have a perfect strategy. Right, Alice can just use this assignment as her strategy. For each xi, she will answer according to this assignment. And Bob can also use this assignment for his strategy. For every clause, he will give you know, the value of this assignment on the clause. And they will win with probability 1. Moreover, um, if the preset was not satisfiable, they cannot win with probability 1. Because no matter what strategy Alice uses, if you look at it as if it's an assignment, you know, it's, there is no satisfying assignment, so there will be some clause that is violated. 
And Bob is in trouble on this clause because Bob doesn't know what to answer. No matter what Bob answers on this clause, either it's, he gives an unsatisfiable uh, value, which will cause him to lose immediately, or he gives some satisfiable value on this clause. It must be inconsistent with at least one of the variables. Okay? So the three set is satisfiable if and only if the value is one of this game. wrote that the strategy for Alice is really just an assignment. The strategy for Bob, <coughs> <coughs> Bob assigns each clause a number from 1 to 7, because there's always seven possible satisfying assignments for each clause. So this leads me to this equivalence between games and constraint <coughs> the satisfaction problems, which we call CSPs. Um, we call by the name of label cover, the problem of given this game, this constraint graph, uh, the computational problem of finding the value of this game is called label cover. Okay, so I think uh, what I just showed you is that label cover is NP complete because there's a reduction from three sat. Um, and you can also view label cover itself as a constraint satisfaction problem because you know each of the questions is like a variable and each of the edges is like a constraint. So it's a two local constraint satisfaction problem. And on the other hand, what we saw is that every constraint satisfaction problem, not only three set, any CSP, gives rise to this clause versus variable game. Okay, so it goes both ways, and it's a very syntactic and simple transformation. Uh, Another name for these games is multi-prover interactive proofs, MIP. And another name for CSPs or constraint satisfaction problems are PCP, probabilistically checkable proofs. Uh, and what I just talked about is the equivalence between MIP and PCP in this context. And we know, and we've discussed this uh, week, that uh, when you try to add quantumness into these two models, Somehow the quantumness gets added in different ways and the equivalence doesn't work anymore. So the quantum version of a CSP is very different from the quantum version of a game. But I'm not going to talk about quantum just yet. Let me still stick around with the classical stuff. So uh, going back to the complexity of label cover. So what I just showed is that label cover is np hard. And um, so it's NP hard to decide if a given game has value one or not. It's also NP hard to decide if the value is one or something bounded away from one that's considered a hardness of approximation result. And that's basically the PCP theorem. Uh, and in fact, you can even get a gap as large as you want. So it's hard to decide if the value is one or you know, no more than any small epsilon that you want. And this we can call the strong PCP theorem. So for the benefit of the non-computer science people, let me just say a few words about the PCP theorem. It was proven in the beginning of the 90s. Um, there's many ways to describe it. The one that we usually like and think it's most, it's most interesting is in terms of proof checking, that you know, if someone writes you a proof, you don't need to read the entire proof. It's enough to read a uh, randomly selected number constant number of bits and check that the proof is correct. Uh, but for me, it's co more convenient to think of it as a gap label cover in P hardness. So just the PCP theorem is just equivalent to saying that it's NP hard to decide if a, if a value of a game is one or bounded away from one. And how do you prove this theorem by reduction from, I don't know, three sat? You basically do a gap amplification. You start from the label cover instance that you got from 3SAT, where you know it's NP hard to decide if the value is one or not. And you transform it to a new label cover, G prime, such that if the old label cover had perfect value, so there was a perfect strategy for that game, then there's a perfect strategy for this game. The label cover has value one. And if the value was less than one, then after this transformation, the value becomes uh, bounded away from one. So somehow the gap between the yes and the no cases, which here was 
there was no gap really, it was just like one over polynomial, a small gap. It became amplified to a constant gap. In fact, uh, as I said, there's a strong PCP theorem where the gap is not only between 1 and 1 minus epsilon, it's between 1 and a small epsilon. And how do you get that? Well, this transformation, there's also some reduction, but I, I wrote it explicitly because it's such a simple and appealing transformation. It's just take the game G prime and play it in parallel K times where K is sufficiently large to, to get this uh, gap. So basically, take the parallel repetition of this label cover and voila, you get uh, that if the value was 1, it stays 1. It's always true classically. And uh, if the value was bounded away from 1, then uh, uh, the value goes down to epsilon. So that's a strong PCP theorem. So how do you prove this part, moving from some tiny gap to a constant gap? Uh, so there's uh, one way to prove it is through, the, the original way is through algebraic encoding. You take uh, the variables of this label cover and you encode it uh, some low degree extension. And uh, some more things. And another way is a, a combinatorial way that's more related to parallel repetition. Essentially it's a de-randomized parallel repetition. So it's very appealing to kind of amplify a gap between the yes and no instances by some kind of repetition. And even if the gap was very small, you can still try to do it. Take the parallel repetition and the gap grew a little bit. Then take the parallel repetition again, the gap grew. Is that a question? Uh, my question is that, so I realize that the main component of your proof is a gap enlarging reduction. But I have never seen it as a randomized per repetition. Okay, so yeah, it's so. It's very enlightening to me if you told me like why why it's yeah. a random? Okay, so thanks for the question. <laughs> right. So yeah. So I guess it's one of my, the points I want to make that it, it is a really a de-randomized parallel repetition. So let me first just say why I say it, and then try to explain why. So uh, uh, if I just applied parallel repetition repeatedly, I would be in bad shape because every time you apply parallel repetition. Uh, what you're doing essentially is instead of looking at all the questions, you're looking at something like all k tuples of questions. And so if you do it again and again, the size of your instance blows up very large. So you really can't afford to do it sufficiently many times to, to increase the gap from 1 over polynomial to a constant. But if you manage to get a de-randomized parallel repetition, and by that what we mean is instead of looking at all possible k tuples, you look at a small subset of k tuples, say a linear uh, in, so n is the, the number of questions in your game. K is, you know, the parameter of parallel repetition. So you, you want linear in n, not polynomial in n. Number of k tuples and still get a, a gap amplification, then that would qualify as de-randomized parallel repetition. <coughs> and in this proof, this is what we do. We look at uh, k tuples of question pairs. Mario, I'll, I'll say more in, in, a, in a bit. Uh, and manage to amplify the gap a little bit, and then we do some correction step because the alphabet grows too much, so you reduce the alphabet, and do again, de randomize parallel repetition, increase the gap some more, do a correction step, and so on and so on, until you get a constant gap. So that's like a, a two-line description of the proof. Um, the reason maybe you're not used to think of it, of it as de randomized parallel repetition is because um, uh, Usually we describe it as if you, know, you look at the constraint graph and you look at a bunch of uh, vertices in this graph. But um, um, I don't want to get too much into the details, so let's do this. Uh, maybe at the end of the talk, if you want to ask me again, I can explain in more detail why it's de-randomized parallel repetition. Okay. Right. I think I start to understand. Yes. I think the reason I did not look at it as de-randomized parallel repetition because you looked at the negative <coughs> Of a of a point, right? But now I realize that actually that neighborhood was not really a neighborhood because you forced a, an expander graph upon your structure. So that was actually a, the neighborhood was the artifact of this pseudo-random way of selecting many many points rather than right. But even if it wasn't forced. A neighborhood is some k-tuple of uh, questions. Of course, it's very specific. 
in that way, it's de-randomized. So it's not all possible k tuples. It's only these neighborhoods. But, but yeah. Okay. So uh, I guess the point of uh, this discussion is that uh, you know parallel repetition or de-randomized parallel repetition is useful for this uh, amplification, for gap amplification. So let, let me talk a little bit more about repetition. Right. So the simplest to analyze repetition is just sequential repetition. That's like the first thing I would do if I needed to amplify a gap. I have some gain, and I know there is some gap between the yes and the no cases. I'll just run the gain twice, and I'm claiming the gap will grow. And by this, what I mean is that you know, if it was a yes instance, I would accept always, so this doesn't change if I run it twice. But if this was a no instance, then uh, you know, the error probability of the game is the probability of accepting even though I should have rejected. So if I run the game twice, you know, I'm doubling the probability of finding, of rejecting. Okay? So the probability that I accept twice is now exponential in two. And if I do it t times, it becomes exponential in t. Okay? So if I run the game t runs, the probability of not catching an error is exponential in t. And you know, if you don't want to think of t runs with the same two provers, you can also think of you know, having two T provers, and you play the game with these two separately and independently with these two and so on. So you have two T provers, and the probability of not catching a problem is, again, exponential in T. Now, how does this translate back to a CSP? So it's very natural to think of a game and rounds or many provers. But in terms of a CSP, <laughs> what's going on is that, um, for example, if you think of this two T prover situation, it's like you're uh, reading simultaneously two t bits from the proof, okay? Instead of just reading two bits or you know, two answers, you're looking at two t answers. So, if you translate this back to a CSP, uh, a t round uh, game is not a two local CSP. It's rather it's a two t local. Okay, so does this make sense? Cool. So. Um, it's not uh, t local, but on the other hand, it has all these other nice properties, right? The number of bits you read from the proof is linear in t, and the error that you get is exponential in t. And that's, you, you can think about it, it's, uh, it's optimal up to the O factor. So, um, and in fact, the one thing that's not optimal here is the fact that I'm wasting a lot of randomness to rerun the game again and again. I'm, I'm using t times log n bits of randomness, but this can easily be fixed. You can actually use t plus log n bits of randomness. Uh, and this would give you like the optimal parameters uh, uh, for this kind of um, game. And what you would get is like the sequential uh, inspiration for the sliding scale conjecture. It's, um, you know, it, it's a CSP that has all the correct properties like the sliding scale conjecture that Dana talked about a few days ago. Um, the only problem with it is that the constraints are 2t local and not, uh, say, O of 1 local. Um, why do we insist on this 2 local or O of 1 local? So 2 local for, uh, in particular is most uh, desirable uh, because it's very useful for proving hardness of approximation. If you prove uh, you know, NP hardness of, of this thing with two local CSPs, then you can use it to uh, prove stuff, for example, about graph problems, because you know, graphs are also these two local things, right? Edges are between two vertices. So you can kind of use graph problems to simulate two local constraints, and this will prove that solving the graph problem is as hard as solving the thing that you assume is hard. So anyway, uh, to summarize this part, I'm just saying that uh, sequential repetition I is like uh, moving from a constant locality CSP to a t-local CSP. That's not hard to do. Getting it back to a constant locality CSP <coughs> is like, instead of sequential repetition, doing parallel repetition. So this is our uh, approach. I mean, there could be other ways, and in fact, um, there are algebraic ways to reduce the number, the, the locality of CSPs that are very uh, successful, but you know, in the context of this session, I'm talking about parallel repetition. So, uh, another way that we can try to reduce the error of a game or to amplify the gap 
is by parallel repetition. So now we have a picture for parallel repetition. So here we have two games. One is G and one is G prime, and we're playing it in parallel. So what does that mean? It means that the verifier, uh, there's still just two players, Alice and Bob. The verifier now chooses one edge at random UV from this game, and independently an edge at random U prime, V prime from this game. Okay? And then uh, the verifier sends the two U endpoints, U and U prime, are sent to Alice. And V and V prime are sent to Bob. Okay? And Alice needs to give an answer both to the question U in G and to the question U prime in G prime. And Bob gives the answers to uh, V and V prime, beta and beta prime. And of course, they win if alpha and beta satisfy the first constraint in G, and alpha prime and beta prime satisfy the second constraint in G prime. So that's playing these two games in parallel. Um, Again, I'm in the classic situation. There's no communication between Alice and Bob, and so their strategies are really functions that map every pair of questions to Ali that Alice gets. She gives a pair, of, a pair of answers, and every pair of questions that Bob gets, he gives a pair of, a pair of answers. Now, if you want to uh, understand what the game is, what the constraint graph is, you can't just view these two games separately. You need to combine them and, and understand what the, the game is that corresponds to this, uh, this uh, protocol. And when you do that, you realize that the game is a very nice uh, thing. The questions on Alice's side are just the product of the questions, u times u prime. The questions on Bob's side is just v times v prime. And you have an edge between your u prime and v v prime if there is an edge on e along each coordinate. So it's a kind of a tensor, pro <coughs> a tensor product between these two games. And we'll see later exactly that it's a tensor product of the proper operator. So you know, we've defined parallel repetition. We've also defined the product operation between two games. And so we've defined the product between two games, and you can generalize it to k. You know, product of k uh, copies of g. And then you know, Alice's questions will be all k tuples u1 up to uk. Bob's questions will be k tuples v1 up to vk, and so on. Okay. So now, you know, what are natural questions to ask here? One question is, so you have two games, h, or I guess g1 and g2, and you know something about their values, right? So the value of g1 is something, omega 1. The value of g2 is omega 2. Can you say something about the value of G1 times G2? I think this is a very natural question. Uh, it's a hard question, which is maybe why people ask the following slightly easier question, which is if you know something about the value of G and you take the parallel repetition with K going to infinity, what can you say about the value of G to the K? Uh, right, so one thing you can say is that the value of g to the k is always at least alpha to the k, because the players can always play a product strategy. Alice can always, you know, she sees a bunch of questions, u1 up to uk. She can answer each one of them according to the strategy for just g. And so can Bob, in which case value, their value will be just alpha to the k. Uh, the trouble is that that's not the best thing they can do. Sometimes they can do much better. Uh, and that's a source of, uh, you know, that's why maybe these questions are interesting. Okay, so let's say some history about these things. <coughs> so um, initially it was conjectured that parallel repetition behaves exactly like sequential repetition, uh, but quickly this turned out to be false. It was discovered that there are games where the value of playing the game twice is exactly the same as the value of playing the game once. So in that sense, maybe an answer to my first question of what can you say about the value of g times h? If you know the value of g, you know the value of h. Maybe you can't say much. Uh, but <coughs> nevertheless, it was proven that if you take k uh, to go to infinity, the value goes down to 0. And Feige and Killian were maybe the first that proved an explicit bound. And they showed that the value goes down polynomially with k uh, if the initial value was bounded away from 1. And then there's a very famous theorem by Ran Laz called the parallel repetition theorem, where it proved for every game that if the value is bounded away from one, then the value of the repeated game goes down 
exponentially with the number of repetitions. Then this was uh, consequently improved and simplified. And uh, for projection games, we know that the value is uh, 1 minus epsilon squared over some constant raised to the k. Yes, Did yes. the Python TBM show it for general repetition or some modified? Yeah, they had to add some other, some other uh, questions, confuse, compare questions. That's true. Is there a question? But the original RAS is uh, without just the normal. Uh, just the it? vanilla repetition. Just take the game, uh, repeat it. Um, and then there, in, in, in the past few years, there's been a lot of interest in getting these two down to a one. Um, because there was a potential, a very nice application of this. You can take a max cut instance, take the parallel repetition of it, and get a unique games instance. And if the value, a maxcat instance is a XOR uh, game, so it's a very special game. Maybe you know, for these games, parallel repetition is even, is even better, and you, and you can get 1 minus epsilon. And if that were the case, you would get a reduction from the hardness of maxcat to the hardness of unique games, where we know the converse. We know that if unique games is hard, then maxcat is hard. So that would have been a really nice thing, and people really tried to prove that. But it turned out that it, uh, Parallel repetition won't give us uh, this result, and that this too must be there. And this is a beautiful example of uh, Ran Raz showing, you know, a max step game or XOR game, where the value is going like this: one minus epsilon squared. So finally, just to say, so the, the main application of this theorem is for hardness uh, of approximation. Basically, what I showed you in the beginning: how to start from our PCP theorem and get to a strong PCP theorem, amplifying the gap of label cover to be between you know one and any tiny delta. So now, yes. Were strong PCP theorems known before the parallel repetition theorems were proved? No. The answer is well. I guess uh, I guess no. But since then, uh, there is another work of Ron Raz and Dana Moskowitz that give a uh, strong PCP theorem without parallel repetition. And you know, in some respect, much better parameters because the size is almost linear and not like exponential in k. So that's much better. It's worse in some other relationship between the error and the alphabet. But uh, OK, so. Oh, you're right, actually, and the phage so, But these are parallel repetitions. It's just not Ross as a result, but it's true that it's parallel repetition. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's also uh, other results that show a very, very large gap, but not with uh, two local constraints, with const of one local. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I have one question for the, uh, what, what is the projection game? Right, so I, uh, I'm going to oh, get there. Okay. Uh, to say in one sentence, it's a game where the constraints have this form where the answer of Bob determines the answer of Alice. But yeah, spend a slide on it, you know, maybe a slide after this one. Um, <coughs> so, uh, okay, now moving to the entangled value. So, you know, entangled the uh, value of a game. A game is still the same thing, exactly. It's given by a label cover. Uh, the only thing is that the strategies allowed for Alice and Bob are slightly different. Now they're sharing entanglement so that the strategy for Alice is no longer a function from her questions to answers, but rather for every question Alice uh, needs to decide of a set of, about a set of measurements and then she measures and based on the outcome of the measurement she gives an answer. And similarly to Bob. Oops. So, uh, Right, so the semantics are a bit different. Basically, <coughs> the strategy is, is something like this. For every question you, you have a collection of matrices that describe this measurement. Uh, right. So what do we know about uh, parallel repetition for the entangled value of a game? Uh, so um, another Games, uh, class of games that we've been discussing here are the no, non-signaling uh, games where the strategies for Alice and Bob are expected to be non-signaling. For this we know 
problems to improve the uh, parallel repetition that goes down exponentially. And then uh, it was proven that uh, parallel repetition for XOR games uh, is also uh, with an exponential decay. This was uh, then pr uh, extended to unique games. And uh, for general games, or not just unique games, Kemp and Vidic proved the parallel repetition theorem that's analogous to the feige killian uh, proof. And actually, they also, I think, their proof followed the feige killian uh, reasoning. And they showed a polynomially decaying bound. So the value goes down like a polynomial in K, one over a polynomial in K. Uh, <laughs> and then recently, there have been uh, three works, I guess, presented this afternoon uh, on uh, exponentially decaying parallel repetition for various uh, restrictions. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is about parallel repetition for a class of games called projection games or projection constraint games. And our theorem is this, if the entangled value of the single game is 1 minus epsilon, then the value of the repeated game goes down like 1 minus epsilon to the 4 uh, raised to the k. So it goes down exponentially. Okay. Yes? The, for Einstein, he, he does not prove any bound. He just says it goes down. He oh, he does prove a bound. I just... But I don't it's not exponential? No, it's exponential. It's exponential. It proves a parallel, an exponentially decaying parallel repetition, but for non-signaling strategies. So it doesn't imply anything for a, the entangled value. For non-signaling, but it's not non-signaling. Is it the stronger result? It then? might be that the non-signaling value is one. Oh, I see. Then so if it is not one, then it's stronger. Yeah. But if it's one. Right, yeah, thanks. Okay. okay, so what are games with uh, projection constraints? <laughs> uh, a game is projection if uh, for every question pair there's a very specific structure on the constraint <coughs> where the answer from Bob determines only one unique valid answer from Alex. Okay, so I guess pictorially, if these are the two questions, uh, u and v, and here, you know, think of the clause versus variable game. So Alice has two possible answer, answers, and Bob has some, I don't know why, five here possible answers. Then, you know, for every answer for Bob, there's exactly one possible answer for Alice that would make the uh, players win the game. Right? So given the inputs? Given the inputs, the questions, yeah. So, you know, for, for B1, the answer is A1. For B2, the answer is A2. For B3, the answer is A1. So you see that the uniqueness <laughs> is, is one way. It's just that Bob's answer determines Alice's answer, but not Alice's answer determining Bob's answer. If the uniqueness was both ways, then we would call these unique games. It's going one way, it's called projection games. Okay, and uh, I guess... Most of the games that we know are projection games. So uh, XOR games are projection games. Unique games are projection games. Here are a number of other games that are <coughs> all projection games. But some games are not projection games, right? So there is this hidden matching game. You can invent many games that are not projection games. But uh, bear in mind that there is a very <coughs> simple transformation that takes any game and converts it into a projection game. Uh, however, um, and this, this transformation is something like the clause versus variable transformation, you know, like, but I, I'm not going to describe it exactly. And the value stays roughly the same. If it was one, it stays one, and if it's bounded away from one, it, become, it stays bounded away from one, but this is only true for the classical value. For entangled values, transformation <coughs> can do a lot of harm and really ruin the, the entangled. So it might be that the entangled value was high, but then after the transformation, it drops. Okay, so in that sense, uh, classically, you, you have, it's a more valid argument to say that projection gains are uh, somehow universal. Uh, quantumly, you know, it's, a richer, it's a richer situation. So now moving on to more recent things. So <coughs> in recent work with David Storer, 
we, we gave a new proof for a prior repetition theorem uh, for the restricted class of uh, projection games. Uh, and this proof is uh, very linear algebraic or analytical. Uh, and using this proof, we obtained a couple of new bounds that were not known before. One is that if the value of the original game is small, it's, it's not one minus epsilon, it's some very small row, then when you repeat it, uh, you expect the, you know, the exponential bound to have a base that depends on this row. And so this is what we proved, that you know, if you repeat the game, it becomes even smaller. And we also analyzed the case where the number of repetitions is very small compared to this epsilon. And these had uh, various uh, motivations. Uh, for the low value, this implied some new uh, hardness results for set cover, which I guess was a long-standing question to settle the complexity of approximating set cover. And this was relying on the work of many other people. Uh, um, the point is that is more interesting in this context is that this framework of uh, proving parallel pitching through linear algebra uh, extends very nicely to studying entangled value. Okay. And so what I want to do in the remainder of this talk is to describe this uh, linear algebraic or analytical proof that we had and show how it uh, generalizes or extends to uh, uh, give bounds on the entangled value. So here is the proof overview of the classical parallel repetition in this uh, framework. So the first step is just to kind of explain what the analytical setup and basically show how a projection game can be viewed as a linear operator that acts on Bob assignments and transforms them into Alice assignments. This is very analogously to how a graph acts on probability distributions by taking a step in a random walk. The second step is to, uh, I guess, describe the value of a game as some kind of bilinear form and then change it to uh, something that we call the collision value, which is uh, describable as some kind of a two-norm, which is very nice to work with. This is very easy. The main step and the uh, most interesting is uh, to define a new relaxation of the value of a game. So a value of a game, you can think of it as some kind of parameter. You you have a game, and for every game, there is this number describing the value of a game. So uh, this relaxation is another kind of parameter of the game. And it has the following two very uh, useful properties. The first is multiplicativity. So when you take the parallel repetition of two games, you know, the, the product of them, then the, this relaxed value has this multiplicativity property. Value of g times h is the value of g times the value of h. And the second is that it's a good approximation of the game value. So that uh, you can prove that if the value plus of g is uh, large, then the value of the original game is also large. It's a relaxation, so the val plus is always going to be at least as large as the value. But this shows that it's not a huge relaxation. Uh, and, okay, and from these properties, you immediately get a parallel repetition, an exponential parallel repetition bound, because you, know, you follow this <laughs> chain of inequality. You want to bound the value of the k-fold repeated game. First, you move to this collision value. This is almost the immediate, so one Cauchy Schwartz. Uh, from here, you move to the relaxed value. This is just because it's a relaxation. Okay. It at number two, the val plus is equal to uh, this collision value or equal to, to the value itself? Number uh, two. Uh, three, number two. This, you mean? No, this. No, uh, yeah. Should be ah, it should be the collision value. value. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but since the collision value is also a good approximation of the value, as long as you're informal like this, then both, uh, sure. both are yeah. true. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so, so so far we just uh, are upper bounding, so we moved from the value of g to the k to the val plus of g to the k, and then you use the multiplicativity to say, ah, this equals the val plus of g raised to the k, so this is just a number raised to the k, and then you use the approximation to say that this number is really quite equal or almost equal to the value of g raised to the k, and that's how you get the number. Question? Could it be that you lost the one half? 
Yeah. One half? The power one half somewhere. Oh yeah, I, uh, you know. <laughs> I lost a bunch of things when I do this uh, approximate, <laughs> right? It can be raised to the one half, right? So it but you lost them already in the inequalities to one half. Ah, uh, did it's I? Yeah, uh, but, but it's also, you know, it doesn't matter in the end. No, I didn't lose them, you know, the value is less than the collision value, that's fine, it's like this part. Next step. Yeah, but the next one. Uh, okay. <laughs> you, uh, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> Okay, good. So this is the uh, you know this is the proof overview of the classical parallel repetition that we had with David, and now we want to uh, quantize it by adding this star. Okay, so uh, what would you do if you were me? Uh, the thing to do is to go to Thomas and uh, talk to him. Right? <laughs> you add a V to your author set, and uh, this is a very uh, this was a great idea. <laughs> and then everything else is kind of streamlined and follows very nicely. <laughs> so indeed, uh, turns out that it's a kind of, the proof over you doesn't change at all. You just do everything with adding stars along the way. Okay, so now what I want to do is give some more details about this proof over you and at every step kind of explain how we do it classically and then how we do it for the entangled value. Okay, so let me start with the analytical set. <coughs> okay, so now I want to say how uh, a, a game or a constraint graph can be viewed as a linear operator. The first step is to move from a constraint graph to the label extended graph, where each question V is now blown up into a cloud of sigma vertices, <coughs> right, one for each answer. And then every constraint <coughs> can be replaced by you know, a bipartite graph describing this constraint, where you connect the answer beta with answer alpha if this pair of answers satisfies <coughs> the constraint. Okay, and this gives you what's called the label <coughs> extended graph. So now there's no more constraints. It's just a bunch of vertices and edges. And this completely describes the game. Now uh, the strategies for Alice and Bob can be written not as functions from V to sigma, but rather as functions from V cross sigma, which is this vertex set, to R. Uh, there are going to be non-negative functions. And uh, a function is an assignment if it's non-negative and if, you know, it, well, it, an assignment the way we're used to is, you know, it selects one label, so it gives one to this one and zero to the rest but you can slightly generalize it by just giving a distribution. So it will give some number fv beta to each beta, and these numbers should sum up to one. Okay, so it's like Bob is saying, with probability fv beta, I'm going to answer beta. Okay, so that's our definition of an assignment. Now, uh, this uh, game, this graph, can be viewed as a linear operator mapping assignments for Bob to assignments for Alex. And <coughs> the description is exactly given by this uh, formula. You see, you see it's some kind of uh, linear uh, aggregation of the values for Bob to give some value for Alice. And there is a very uh, natural uh, interpretation of this. If you want to understand what the assignment, you know, GF, the assignment for Alice gives at point U alpha, it's the probability that a random neighbor of you, so you know, Alice stands here at some point U alpha. First, she, sh she selects a random neighbor V of you. And then the answers that Bob gives to V, since every answer to Bob dictates one uh, unique answer to Alice, the answers that Bob gives tells Alice what answer Bob expects her to give. Right? So this gives a distribution of Alice's answers. And you take expectation of these distributions over all neighbors uh, of Alice, and this gives you uh, GFU alpha. And uh, the point is that if the game is a projection game, and only if that is the case, uh, a strategy for Bob maps to a strategy for us. Uh, question? Yes. Sorry, I, I missed what was the connectivity between you and V. So if there is a, uh, in the constraint graph that describes again, if there is a, an edge between you and V, then this edge has a constraint on it, saying you know which pairs of questions will be accepted by the verifier. And then you connect these uh, black edges between pairs of labels that cause the you know, the player is to win. Okay, basically encoding the constraint by, by edges. 
So again, every question was now blown to a set of sigma vertices describing all the possible answers. And here it's also a set of sigma vertices describing the possible answers. And a pair is just a pair of answers that, that causes you to accept. Okay, so you know maybe this looks like uh, a lot of details, but you can uh, you can see that the, the definition is just some kind of natural uh, way to linearly map strategies for bulk to strategies for us. Okay, next, we want to describe the <coughs> value of a game as a bilinear form. And this is given here. So if Bob plays strategy F and Alice plays strategy G, we can consider the inner product between GF and G, just defined like this, you know, so it's some sum or expectation over all U alpha of GF at point U alpha times G at point U alpha. So it's just an inner product. And this is uh, <coughs> exactly the value of the game. Okay, you can see that this is exactly equal to the value of the game when Bob plays F and Alice plays G. And so if you want to maximize over all possible strategies F and G, you get, by definition, the value of the game. Okay, so the nice thing is that we've expressed the value of the game in some kind of linear, <coughs> bilinear form. Okay, now, uh, uh, finally, just uh, to mention that the parallel repetition is indeed a tensor product. If you view this as a linear operator, and another game H is another <coughs> linear operator, then uh, the tensor product of these operators exactly corresponds to the parallel repeated game. Okay, and you can see it in this definition. But okay. So uh, now moving on to the quantum uh, version. Okay, so in the quantum version, it's no longer true that Bob's strategy is something like this. Bob is not giving for every question and answer pair a number describing a probability. Uh, <coughs> instead, for every uh, question V to Bob, and for every answer, there is some kind of matrix describing a measurement, right? And the collection of over all possible answers of these matrices should, should sum to the identity, right? So these are positive semi-definite matrices summing to the identity. So FVB is a matrix now, okay? So this is a, a, supposed to denote a matrix that's D by D. And similarly for Alice, okay? For every question-answer pair, Alice uh, has some measurement and they should sum to identity. For every u, the sum over answers is identity. And now, uh, just like before, the, the game here maps. So what is a, a strategy, really? It's a vector of matrices, right? For every v and b, I have a matrix. OK, so I have a vector of matrices here with some conditions of summing to identity, but that's not important now. And the operator just maps this vector to another vector of matrices. And you can check that. Uh, you know, with exactly the same formula, except now we're interpreting this not as a scalar, but as a matrix. So this is again a matrix. Um, OK, and you can uh, check that if this was uh, a strategy, meaning these conditions help, then GF is a strategy for Alice, just for the same reasons as before, and just because the game is a projection. Uh, Next, we had this uh, nice description of the value of a game as a bilinear form. We have this here too, but we need to define the correct bilinear form. And this is uh, what it is. <coughs> so now, you know, instead of uh, multiplying the value uh, g u alpha times the value uh, f v beta, we have this thing where um, you take the, the tensor of these two measurements and apply them to the entangled state. And this gives you, uh, you know, the, Whenever uh, the two values match, the players win the game. So if you open this up, you get exactly the description that is the, the description of when the players uh, uh, win the game, when they play strategies G and F, and use entangled state Psi. Maybe I, I didn't put it up before, but this is uh, the, the description. So uh, just define this as some kind of a bilinear form. And now you can see that if you maximize over all possible strategies, you get uh, what is defined to be the entangled value. Okay. So this um, G is, a, is like a super operator. So it should have some linearity, right? What's a super it's operator? A matrix, sorry. It's a, it's a matrix where you The little G. It maps matrices into matrices. G maps matrices. I guess so, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So it's, it's kind of a super operator. Okay. It's scored in, in 
entire school. Fair enough, okay. Um, so, but what do we know besides Lina, what do we know about it besides linearity? So, if you apply the same method every matrix entry, that's what it means. And that's exactly what you does. I mean, G actually hasn't changed, right? Like when you think of an entangled value, the game is the same game, so G is the same G. It's just that it's true that, you know, these vectors are now, you know, larger dimensional in the sense that every entry is a matrix. But when you try to understand how to combine this, it's the same G that's, that's telling you, you know, it's the same formula here, see? Yes, but for instance, for super operators, we request that they be like positive or totally positive. Nothing, no, no, no requirement. Like no, no, no. I mean, G is a fixed thing, right? It's not, G is the same as it was before it describes the game. It's not a generic super operator. It's a fixed thing. It depends only on the game. So, it's not that there's conditions. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so remember in my outline, the <laughs> first step was to describe uh, the linear algebra that describes the value of the game. Next, we want to relax the value. You get this value plus. The first step was to describe the collision value. Um, <coughs> so now we're in the classical setting again. Uh, remember, the value was described by this uh, bilinear form. F and G were now vectors of scalars, not the matrices yet. And this was super taking over uh, strategies. So there was some normalization here. Uh, so moving to the collision value is, is telling Alice, look, you're not allowed to use any strategy you want. You must use the strategy G of F. So basically, we're ignoring Alice's strategy. Bob tells you a strategy, and Alice needs to use the symmetric strategy. Okay, and it turns out that uh, this doesn't uh, lose much. So the, taking this supremo or taking this supremo, which is symmetric, uh, is almost the same. Okay, and this we call the collision value. You can see that it's a nice and symmetric, and it's like a square. And it's, so, you know, it's nice to work with. And to prove this equality is very, very simple. Uh, What's the solution? Why, why it doesn't change much? Um, the explanation is that uh, the value is, uh, is large if, uh, from Alice's point of view, when you look at Bob's strategy, all of Bob's answers want Alice to answer the same thing. Bob is not like confusing Alice. Sometimes he wants something, sometimes he wants something else. So when that's the case, then you know, answering according to what Bob says is as good as answering uh, the best answer. And when Bob is confused, then it doesn't matter what you do, you're, uh, <laughs> you're in bad shape. So, okay. Uh, so, so the loss depends on the number of answers that Alice has? Actually, no, it doesn't depend on it because because uh, it's a projection game, so it doesn't depend. Well, let's talk about it uh, later. Is this not the quality in quotient smart if you're very close to an optimal value, right? So, yeah. uh, I'm getting stressed about the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so, okay. Um, okay, so actually uh, here it's exactly the same thing and I understand that there is a buzzword for this called pretty good measurement that is supposed to say that if uh, instead of Alice playing her own strategy she uses this GF. Uh, uh, again, it's the same and in fact it's the same, it looks like the same kind of Cauchy Schwartz except it's now for matrices. So, yeah, proven but has been proven. So, uh, you know, in terms of writing it down on the paper, it looks exactly the same. Okay. Next is this vector relaxation. This is the main uh, point, and I'm really getting stressed. So, <coughs> let me tell you this. Um, um, the way to relax from this collision value to Valpas is by replacing a strategy uh, that gives for every V and B a value, you replace it by a vector. So it's like a relaxation to a, a vector value strategy, okay? And so, you know, you, you, you replace this inner product by something that looks similar. I guess if I, I should have removed the half here because I don't have it here. And, <coughs> and there is some normalization. So let me skip, skip this uh, really quickly and just tell you, you know, 
the fact that we move to vector strategies makes sense. It's not uh, out of the blue. Uh, it's very uh, intrinsic to talking about parallel repetition. And the reason is that um, already uh, when you think about parallel repetition, what you're trying to do is relate the value of G tensor H to the value of G. And the way you do it is you start with a strategy for G tensor H, and you're trying to extract from it a strategy for G and show that you know, the value is related. But a strategy for G tensor H, what is it? It's indexed by pairs of questions, a question V for G and V prime for H. So it's a vector strategy. If you view it, a strategy for G tensor H is a strategy for G. It's like for every question for G, you have a vector indexed by all questions for H of, of, of things, of answers <coughs> or of measurements, depending if you're in an entangled case or not. So in other words, vector strategies comes up uh, very naturally. And the main uh, issue is you know, how to exactly define uh, what, what's written here and how to define the normalization. In other words, what kind of vectors are you optimizing over? Okay, and that, that's the key issue. And there's a very uh, kind of intuitive way of leading up to this definition, which is basically to uh, try to eliminate the effect of H. So when you're measuring the value of a strategy on G tensor H, you want to eliminate the fact that H also has a value, which is it's causing you to decrease your value. So you want to somehow uh, use the normalization to eliminate this. And um, yeah, I apologize for uh, not being able to explain this better. But, uh, but anyway, uh, if you uh, kind of uh, follow the logic of how to define it, it becomes very, very easy to prove this multiplicativity. Okay, so you, know, you define it properly, and then it just follows that the val plus of g tensor h equals the val plus of g times the val plus of h. And here, uh, when you move to the quantum uh, setting, the whole proof uh, kind of follows uh, very smoothly. So there is nothing special that needs to be done. It just works. Uh, the part that uh, requires much more work is the approximation. So the approximation is really the interesting part. You want to show that this vector <coughs> relaxation that you define uh, didn't uh, ruin the value altogether. It didn't cause the value to be very large while the game has very small value. Okay, so to prove this, you need to do some kind of round rounding algorithm. You need to show that if you have <coughs> a vector strategy that has high value, then you can derive from this vector strategy a regular strategy that also has high value. That's a rounding algorithm. Uh, so a naive way, if you have a vector strategy, is just you know, focus on one coordinate. Here you go. You have now a scalar strategy. And try to prove that this strategy is good. Okay, and sometimes this actually works. Sometimes is when the game has some kind of uniformity. If the game is expanding, then this works. You can find a uh, coordinate where uh, Whatever is written in that coordinate really gives you a strategy. Uh, so that's when the game is expanding. Like if you think of a game that has probability half a free game, probability half your original game. If the game is not expanding, it's not true. There is some, uh, for every coordinate, it might be that only you know, some of the questions have any mass on them. And so on one coordinate, what you have is really a partial strategy. Uh, and then what we do is use correlated sampling. We basically take uh, a partial strategy from one coordinate and a partial strategy from another coordinate and combine all of them together to get a strategy for the entire game. Um, and that's, uh, that's how uh, the proof works. Um, quantumly, uh, the same uh, division holds. If, if the game is expanding, then there is one coordinate where roughly you can you can show that uh, what you have there is roughly the same, but what you have is now uh, a bunch of measurements that don't sum to identity. They sum to maybe a very small part, of something that projects to a very small part of the space. So you need to change your entangled state to be inside that space, and then you get a strategy. If uh, instead you need to combine, uh, if the game is not expanding and you need to combine different coordinates, then you need to do some quantum analog of correlated sampling. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's all I'll say about this. Uh, so one more minute, say. So let me just say, yeah, I won't say <coughs> uh, everything I wanted to say here. Uh, you know what, let me just summarize and then I'll drop the direct product part that I wanted to talk about. Um, so the proof over you view one more time. We framed the, you know, the, the game in terms of some kind of linear operator. 
And then we show the relaxation of the value by moving to a collision value and then to this vector collision value. And then we prove a, a multiplicativity and an approximation a theorem for this uh, val class. And then we get the parallel repetition by a chain of uh, inequalities. That's the way the proof looks. Uh, let me tell you, uh, well, I'll skip this. I'll just say that uh, you know, the main source of trouble in analyzing parallel repetition is the fact that the strategies are not a uh, product. Right? You need to somehow fight the fact that Alice and Bob can use non-product strategies. And I think it's very interesting to study this, like to understand why are non-product strategies good? You know, how good can they be? You know, how does this depend on the game? You just understand the structure of the winning strategies in some way. And I think the one way to understand it, and this has been a, a source of a lot of work in the classical setting, is you know, to find the simplest possible game in which you can still study this question meaningfully. Okay? And there is such a game, it's called the confusing compare game, and it has some free questions, some consistency questions, and some confused questions. And, okay, let's skip this, but um, <clears throat> basically you prove theorems like if the value of a given strategy in this game is large, then the structure of this strategy is close to being direct product. Okay, and this is the kind of theorems that we might also be interested in proving in the quantum uh, setting. Okay, so in the classical setting, there's a lot of work on it. I don't think there's any work on it quantum, and maybe it would be interesting to do. So that's it. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so in the, in the context of how you showed the proof, can, is it possible to see a little bit about where this... Uh, Embezzled idea. Yeah. Maybe uh, Toma would be a better uh, person to answer this. But, uh, okay, so uh, remember uh, in this approximation stage, you want to start with a vector strategy for G and derive in, that has high value and derive from it a strategy for G that has similarly high value. It's uh, like a rounding algorithm. So what, what you have is a, what is a vector strategy? It's like for every question and answer for a Bob, there is a vector of uh, measurement matrices, right? And uh, you, what you need is just one uh, measurement matrix. And the question is what to do. So if you restrict to one coordinate, you will get for every uh, question and answer just uh, uh, one measurement matrix. And what you can prove is that because the vector strategy has high value, you can prove that for a, you know, relate for you know for questions that are a, appear together in a in a question pair, these matrices are similar or something like that, project to similar areas. So your goal is now to, you know, instead of the entangled state that you started with, you want to create a state that, you know, lives inside this small area. Okay, so if I explain correctly. The, your problem is that these projection matrices, since you're restricting to one coordinate, they don't sum to identity. They're all focused on some very small part of the space. Okay, and you want to you know, somehow collapse your state to, to live in that space. But it's not that you know where in this space you want to collapse. So Alice knows roughly where she wants to be. Bob knows roughly where they wa he wants to be. And somehow both of them need to be able to collapse their space to their state to this area. So uh, what do they do? Okay, so now uh, maybe you can help me with this. <laughs> so they use this embezzlement state, right? To uh, each one of them wants to use this embezzlement state to they know classically like where they want to be, and so each one of them wants to uh, do some kind of measurement to force this state to be wherever they want to be. However, their descriptions are of slightly differing states, so they need to do some, some kind of robust version of this. But, uh, okay, I don't know, where is Toma? Maybe you can uh, take me out better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there is, as you said, there is, based on this choice of omega in this, this vector strategy, I mean, there is a, there is a, a dangle state that you want to be using to play the game. But you don't know before the game starts because the state depends 
on the question that you're asked and on this omega that you choose, which is just a coordinate inferred. And so once Alice gets her question, she knows what the entanglement state should be in the wrong regard. When Bob gets his question, he also knows what the entanglement state should be. And because of the proof, then it, it is also a fact that these two states are close to each other. They're not exactly the same, but they're close to each other. And so now they have to come up with that state like Can you say what is known about uh, parallel repetition of non-projective games? Ah, okay, so uh, we'll hear more about this in the next two talks. Uh, they, both of them talk about non-projective games, I think. <coughs> and also this uh, couple years ago, a couple year old result of Tomain de Kempe uh, also proved polynomial decay for non-projective games. So we have some, some things known. I believe that it also should go down exponentially, but we it's haven't got there yet. Not known yet. Well, the next two talks will have a lot of information about this. Yeah. Is there any chance that you can randomize this in the same way how you would be randomized in your school? Uh, like, kind of a randomized quantum per repetition? Yeah, okay, great question, right? I should have mentioned this is another question, although I, I have no idea what application this might have, right? But just out of curiosity, find the de-randomized trial repetition so, theory. Like, of course, your first instinct would be to say it's quantum PCPs, but then we have seen that you cannot create <coughs> quantum PCPs from games for some reason. So if we could... It just syntactically is not the same thing, but it's right? just syntactically is not the same thing. Yeah. So, do you have any thoughts even in the... Pascal or Quantis, whether the, these methods can go beyond projection games? I mean, is it a strict no-go, or do you...? Ah, okay, thanks. So, uh, in the work with David, we had a buggy proof showing okay. that uh, there is a reduction from general games to projection games, that, which would give a result for projection games. Now, I mention it not just to embarrass myself, but uh, to say the proof was buggy, but it's not clear that the construction was uh, wrong. So, you know, oh, so, so it still needs to be analyzed just properly. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, maybe, maybe it can work. Do you think these uh, kind of methods can extend to uh, more than two player games? Yeah, excellent question. So I, I feel that uh, first general games, then three-player games. But this is, you know, I think this is one of the most intriguing open questions. And, you know, there are some crazy games that uh, Harry was supposed to tell me about where it doesn't seem like the value goes down like you would expect. So very strange behaviors can happen. Thanks, Eddie.